Hello, my name is Hector Ramirez. My pronouns are they, them. I am a Chiricahua Apache in Mexican, and I live in the unceded territory lands of the San Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians um, in uh, what is called Los Angeles in the state of California. I am 47 years old, and I'm a person with a disability. I have autism, I am hard of hearing, and I have a mental health uh, disability. I'm also a family member and a caretaker of people with disabilities. One of the questions that I was asked is, what do person-centered thinking, planning, and practice mean to you? It just means nothing about me without me. And similarly, um, for my family members that receive services, nothing about them without them. First of all, when it's person-centered thinking, meaning that the approach that is done, it's really with the idea that is uh, driven by the beneficiary, by the person receiving services, the direct stakeholder, and that the planning, both in the initial stages, ongoing implementation, and the evaluation processes that take place afterwards have uh, that particular stakeholder leading as much as possible, if not really driving that particular effort. We're all more than just our disability or just our need for services. We are very dynamic individuals like everybody else that really strive to advance a myriad of personal facets, whether it be our ethnicity, our spirituality, our religion, our um, sexual orientation, as well as, you know, other aspects of our lives, ability to really engage in community of our choice, maintain those those connections, particularly when possible, as much to our culture and our language. And I say this as a, you know, as a, as a native person, as an indigenous person to whom I am fortunate that my culture is a big part of who I am. It's part of the way my family uh, interacts, but most importantly, the way in which my community functions. And it is one of the things that all of us work really hard to reclaim on a regular basis, having had both language and culture uh, taken away from us. And it's one of the things that we personally hope to advance, not just as people with disabilities, but as a community in general. And so what I mean by culture is not just necessarily focus on the language, reclaiming language or the utilization of language or some of the language that we sometimes will experience from service providers inadvertently for the most part that can be very stigmatizing or insensitive but then also i think when we talk about culture we talk about things like dignity of risk uh, and being able to engage in activities like every other member of our community and being able to explore possibilities or scenarios that oftentimes other individuals or perhaps historically we know might not be beneficial. Similarly, I think culture from an intersectional framework, you know, really allowing individuals an opportunity to decide and having the choice to be able to participate in parts of our community that are primarily driven by equity-seeking populations or individuals that have been struggling with marginalized issues, uh, particularly when dealing with our LGBTQIS community or our indigenous communities, trying to, to thrive or to survive. And oftentimes there are a lot of elements that continue to really oppress those communities and the individuals, those of us that live there. Persons in our planning in a culturally responsive way is really taking into consideration as much of uh, the facets that really make up our unique identities, because we, not only are we very biologically distinct beings, but uh, the way that we experience life and that we celebrate or relate to our communities are also very unique. We might have both disability intersectionality, a regional identity as well, but you know, there, there's just so many different aspects that make up who we are, that providing services to people really with a culturally responsive approach means that not only sometimes are we able to get services from people that not only look or are part of our community, but then also from individuals that have 
an understanding of those particular backgrounds that go beyond cultural competency so that it is more culturally responsive. But that means that people continuously either know about our communities based on what we share and you know the interests that they take in really getting to know you know our backgrounds. I remember, for example, having the availability of having somebody initially who was from the queer community, the LGBTQIA community, be a service provider. And I think for me personally, when I was getting those services, that allowed me for an opportunity to really explore a lot of my choices, but also to really further validate and become more aware of my personal autonomy and choices. Actually, I know for a fact that I had until that time really had an opportunity to explore the possibility that person-centered services could have this included, but it was something that I could ask for and that I was actually very glad that I was able to get. And other ways that, you know, the system can be more inclusive and culturally sensitive is first and foremost, I think is uplifting people's dignities and choices and really having it be part of the design process, not just the time that there is direct services, but also in the way that the planning for this type of services are kind of developed at the state and, and the federal level, uh, making sure that this particular type of guidelines are included in there, that they're actually articulated so that when they are needed, they know we know that there's a reference to it, but that there can also be a certain degree of technical advice that is provided at the different levels of implementation all the way down to the direct services. Because we realize that one of the best ways sometimes that people are able to benefit from services is when they help to design them. And when those services really do help to meet the multiple facets of who we are, that in itself is something that is necessary because I've noticed that there are not necessarily a similar type of follow through in the federal and state implementation. And oftentimes at the local level, uh, we end up having to really be explaining and asking for this type of practices. It's actually taxing. I guess that, that's not necessarily why, why individuals seek services and having to get services and to kind of explain or develop that at, you know, on, on a personal level, oftentimes it's also very taxing. And it's something that can be minimized. Any one of us at any time in our lives have the potential to develop a disabling condition or a permanent condition that might put us in a position where we might need these services. And so it behooves all of us to make sure that as these services are being developed, that they're not only responsive to the people that are currently getting services and that we are learning from past mistakes, but that we also have a more forward type approach from a state and federal level. This is oftentimes they are able to, they're the ones that provide the direct technical service for some of these agencies that provide services, but more than anything else, they are the ones that oftentimes have to ensure that the services um, are, are delivered in a particular way. Because I don't necessarily know of a lot of people that say, I want you to provide my services in the more, the most bland, non-culturally specific, non-person-centered approach you can possibly give. If anything, I think I, we all pretty much oftentimes hear the opposite of that. Th that goes to the other part, which is really to have a system in place in which both the beneficiaries or the people that are receiving the direct services are not able to only give feedback, but also to help drive the conversation and the policy discussions to ensure that as these programs are being developed, that the standards are being created, as evaluation protocols are being set in place, and as funding priorities are being established, that is being done even at the highest level in a person-centered way. It just ends with what so many in the disability community have been saying, nothing about us without us at any at every level, particularly as we use my peers who are people with lived experience, but also people with lived expertise that we are considered and recognized in those spaces where not only should we be at the table, but oftentimes also can be able to partner um, in developing all these different strategies.